end of the world. Well now, let's get this show on the road. I would imagine that for some of you, seeing some of those images and perhaps even seeing some of this here probably brings back a lot of fond memories and nostalgia for you. I sadly did not get to have that or experience that. Now, it's not like I can't experience wrath, you know. I can still do that, whether it's here in retail, or whether it's in classic, as you saw there. Not only did they make Wrath classic, but I've also been seeing that some are going to be making dedicated Wrath-only private servers. So they're going to try to see if they can preserve Wrath of the Lich King as much as they can. In fact, they're going to perhaps put their own spin on it. Um, based on what I saw in this trailer... Uh, advertising that this community group was going to be focusing on that. So it sounds really cool in case I ever want to delve into that and just experience Wrath. But what I'm referring to mainly is that first initial launch experience, you know. And that's part of the reason why I decided to start here in this series. Um, obviously, we are now transitioning from the Burning Crusade to Wrath of the Lich King, which is why I thought it'd be kind of fitting to show one of those possible trailers. Now, I could have gone with the, the cinematic, I could have gone with the uh, first actual announced trailer, but I thought that Journey trailer was really cool since it kind of gives you sights of and sounds of like all the various different things you would be encountering in Wrath, you know? And right away, you could tell that Blizz was learning from their past mistakes. Burning Crusade's launch was a bit of a mess because they had one place for you to start, the Dark Portal into Hellfire Peninsula, which funneling all those players at launch on both factions, it was insanity. Absolute chaos. This time, however... We were given two choices to start off here in Wrath. Either the Berean Tundra or the Howling Fjord. Now, how you got to those was a little different. 
in Orgrimmar, you could... This was actually my first, and you can see this on the video. If you go to my original playthrough of WoW, my first experience in Wrath was being told to hop on a Zeppelin in Orgrimmar and go to the Berean Tundra. And that was my first initial experience when it came to Wrath. The other way would be if you had gone to the Undercity and then hopped on a Zeppelin there at Brill and gone here to the Howling Fjord. Um, for the Alliance's case, it's hop on a ship in Stormwind, which also goes to the Brian Tundra. Or if you want to go to the Howling Fjord, you had to go to Menethil Harbor, I believe. A little odd, but sure, you know. Anyways, I mean, honestly, it makes a little bit more sense uh, in that regard for Horde because you're starting off here and going to here. Or you're starting here and going to here. But with the Alliance, it's... You start off... I, I think Menethil Harbor is... Uh, where is it? Here. So it's just a little north of... north of uh, I'm sorry, Iron Forge. So you're going from here to here. But you're also going from here all the way to here. Now, obviously, the Alliance doesn't really have a, a port over here. I mean, it's not like they were going to have players go from the Exodar or Darnassus to uh, the Berean Tundra. Maybe they could have, but kind of seems unlikely. Seems a little bit more uh, sense that they would actually, like, just because, you know, Stormwind has such a massive harbor to start things off, so. But I would imagine a lot of people, one of their first more pleasant experiences, and this is from what I've heard, and by all means, if you watching this have any personal stories or recollection, I would love to hear them in the comments of what your experience was like when Wrath launched. Where did you start off? How? What is, what's your fondest memory of when you first hopped on one of those Zeppelins or ships and you made your way to Northrend starting Wrath? I've heard some say like they, they uh, on the Alliance, that they sat on the very front of the ship that sailed through this little area here, just seeing the first initial areas of the Howling Fjord and such, you know. And of course you've got the classic iconic music in this place. Ignore the storm giant over there. I mean, Wrath and Northrend, just gorgeous. Especially nowadays here in retail where you can see so much with the rendering. They have upped the rendering so much in this game and I, I love it so much. Being able to see Utgard Keep or Ice Crown Citadel from far off places. Like, you actually can't see it right now, but... If I was to move a little closer, we would see Ice Crown in the distance, you know? And I love that. I love that they're doing that. But yeah, like, you would sail through this little canyon here over to, like, these uh, ports and harbors over here, you know? Like, that's the initial alliance area. They're all red because, of course, PvP and all that, so... Whereas, I believe the Horde Town started off... I think it was here or it was over here at vengeance landing i think again i don't really remember what the initial starting experience in howling fjord for horde side was because i didn't start off there but from what i know and have heard quite a few players did and uh yeah very wonderful pleasant starting experience isn't it you're going to this place you know the lich king is waiting for you the army of the his army of the dead and the scourge and this is what greets you just an absolutely beautiful gorgeous place except for some other things that do definitely give you a uh, a greeting of you're not welcome here, though that's more so on the part of the the Rykul here. And there's that ship I was talking about. People would sit on the very front of the ship on that little bird head right there, just from first-person view and just take in the sights as they're sailing in to the Howling Fjord. With the very pleasant music in this place. Not quite as memorable as the Grizzly Hills music, but still very pleasant, nice music. I've been listening to a lot of the ambient music of WoW, in recent times, just when I'm doing stuff like farming or grinding stuff. And when the Howling Fjord came up, it was just nice, relaxing, pleasant music, you know? So, this monstrosity here, obviously not nearly as impressive as Ice Crown Citadel, but 
it's quite the fortress for the Vrykul, which we uh, come to learn quite a bit about here in Wrath, along with the Proto-Drakes as well. And that's something we will, as we go through the dungeons here, like the first two dungeons we dealt, we will deal with here are of course dealing with the Vrykul here in Utgard Keep. And it's kind of their own separate thing. And there's of course multiple storylines for a expansion that was clearly very focused on the Lich King. And trust me, the Lich King will be a present in some of these dungeons, quite a few of them. But there's multiple storylines going on, which of course are carryovers from the quest lines that you do in the zones. Um, very much the story in this zone carries over into the dungeons, and the same thing applies throughout, you know, the continent. It was definitely showcasing what I said earlier about how Blizzard, as they were progressing, was, was trying to do this more and up the quality when it came to, when it came to the storytelling of their dungeons and such, along with the raids. So, like, you know, questing here in this area for the Berean Tundra uh, would play into what happens in the Oculus and the Nexus, and of course the Eye of Eternity when you do the raid. Um, you know, and we'll, and then of course you, you know, that's the Nexus War stuff along with stuff here in Dragonblight, along with what's going on with the Norubians, with Ajdul Norub, and we'll get to that later, of course. Um, <laughs> gosh, the Violet Hold. I'll talk about that when we get there. Um, and then, of course, you know, we'll talk about, of course, each of these, the storylines for each of these different ones here as we go through them uh, when it comes to things like the Gundrak Dungeon, Drak Theron Keep, of course, both the Halls of Lightning and the Halls of Stone, and then, of course, the, the big trifecta. Now, you might be wondering if I'm going to be doing those dungeons again, considering that I've already done multiple videos on those dungeons. And I decided, yes, I'm going to go ahead and do them one more time, and I'm going to make sure I do the version that I prefer, which, of course, is the Alliance side, in my opinion. Um, since that, to me, has the real story of those dungeons compared to the Horde side, which really doesn't. Um, and honestly, I just prefer... <laughs> um, that, you know, having Jaina being a much more pleasant, actual, decent person compared to Sylvanas, who is horrible in there. And the interaction she has with Uther just makes me cringe compared to the actual, like, nice interaction between Jaina and Uther. But we'll, we'll get there, we'll get there. In the meantime, we have this very long story that on both sides, and of course, if you want the entire story, you have to do this on both factions, um, of finding out more about the Vrykul, and what was going on, and of course, what's what do they have to do with what's going on here and the Lich King and such? Well, um, by the way, in case you're wondering, yeah, I decided to go ahead and do this on one of my Death Knights. This is my Goblin Death Knight that I used to get the Heritage Armor, and I just recently got her to 70 this past week during Time Walking, since it definitely helps out with that. Um, I decided to throw on her um, an old classic set from Wrath for old time's sake, along with uh, Shadowborn. But uh, yeah, I figured having a Death Knight here would be kind of fitting, you know? Utgard Keep was, a, was long thought to be abandoned, a relic of a lost civilization among the central cliffs of the Howling Fjord. And yet in recent days, something has roused the fortress's slumbering residents, the Vrykul. Oh, I was wondering what that was. It's just kind of like the uh, trail of the uh, appearance of Shadowborn. So, never mind. So, I believe the quest NPC will spawn after we start taking care of some of the trash in here. Now, if you're wondering, well, why are we going in here? Well, we actually get quests when you do the story as it is with the usual WoW uh, common days, when you do the story and such, you'll eventually get a quest to go take on the, f the first boss in here. Not the last one, the first one. We'll talk about him when we get there. Let me just see if this is correct. Ah, there she is. Dark Ranger Mara. She only shows up once you take care of the first trash in here. My arrows strike true. Uh, of our entire recon party, only I remain. These Vrykul are relentless fighters, given their numbers and their savage tactics. Our only hope is to bring down their leader and pray it brings chaos to their ranks. Ingvar is his name. 
bring me his head. What do you seek? Utgard's forces are organizing under the advisory of Prince Kelliseth, a Sand Lane ambassador of the Scourge. We cannot allow the Vrykul to benefit from his counsel any further. Silence him. I watch. We must I discover the secret to these savages' weapons. If you'd have seen how easily they cut through my companions, you'd understand my sense of urgency. Scour the place. Gather all of their arms that you can carry. I serve the Banshee Queen. So, in regards to the Vrykul, I mentioned that during Wrath we actually discover a lot more about the Vrykul, but not just the Vrykul, but also some other races as well. This is where we start learning more about some of the origins of some of the races on Azeroth, especially when it comes to their connection to the Titans. And uh, what we learn about the Vrykul is that they are a very old race. They're one of those old Titan races, uh, including some of the others like the Dwarves and the Gnomes and others like that. Well, we also find out something else about the Rykul. That the humans actually came from them. Yes, as in humans are former Rykul in Warcraft. So what we learn in the in the story in the questing is that humans were kind of a odd, deformed version of the Rykul that when they discovered them. Their initial instinct was to just simply get rid of them. By the way, this is a giant skull furnace that they used to smelt their weapons. Why this? Why is their furnace a giant skull? Yeah. <laughs> because they thought it would be cooler. You know, it's just one of those like, it's like, eh, just just go with it. Don't don't question their their uh their aesthetics. They like what they like, right? Also, you'll notice some of them are called dragon flayers because uh, they have a tendency to want to tame uh, the dragons here and the proto-drakes as, uh, well, you can see, enslaved proto-drakes and just simply use them as they can when it comes to either mounts or, you know, pets. Yeah. So it's also worth noting that these are not sentient uh, drakes, not like the ones that we have come to know in the likes of Dragonflight. These are proto-drakes that are still very, like, animalistic in terms of not having actual, like, sentient and sapience. Like, they're intelligent, but they're intelligent in, re in the same regards that, say, a wolf is intelligent. You know, that kind of, like, okay, it's an animal, but it's it's still smart. It's It's not intelligent to, like, you know, figure things out like a human can or speak, but it is still intelligent. So, this is Prince Keliseth. The Lich King deployed Keliseth to Utgard Keep in hopes of harnessing the Vrykul's potential for destruction. Upon arriving, the Ambassador found a people who were more than eager to assist the Scourge. The Keep has proved to be an excellent staging point for terrorizing the Howling Fjord, and Keliseth has no intention of losing it to insolent trespassers. So, yeah. So, first you want to go ahead and, uh, clear these, though you can go ahead and do that, but you'll also know stuff like, um, this map here with things such as the camps, fortresses, and something on their map. No one sure what that is. Eh, I'm sure it's not a big deal. But, uh, he has Shadow Bolt, so of course you gotta deal with that and try to interrupt it. He has Frost Tomb, where he'll put a random player in a block of ice, stunning them for 20 seconds... And he's got Vrykul Skeletons, so he will start calling forth Skeletons to aid him in battle, which do Decrepify and uh, Unstoppable. As long as he lives, they are unstoppable, can't be stopped, and are brought back to life 20 seconds after they're killed. So you're basically having to try and burn this guy down before those things can keep coming back and just eventually overwhelm you. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, see if I can show off a bit of the fight here. And just kind of like, you know what, Ghoul, go, just, uh, just go away for now. Your blood is mine! So you can't interrupt the Shadow Bolt, as you can see. Arano Ladell! Their fate shall be yours! And there are the skeletons. You see them getting summoned from the hallway over there. I thought you could interrupt the Shadow Bolt, but apparently you can't. Not so bad. And he now puts me in a block of ice. 
It's okay, I'm a death knight. I've got icebound fortitude. So yeah. And you can see there's also plenty of ghouls here. Why? Well, because, yeah, remember, he came here on behalf of the Lich King. By the way, I hope you don't get tired of the Lich King as we go through these dungeons, because as I said, he is a, a presence throughout a good number of them. And even if he's not in the dungeon, he his influence is there. A lot of the stuff that's happening is there because of the Lich King. In fact, you will hear a number of uh, NPCs and such refer to the Lich King as the Death God, or the God of Death, which is funny, considering that uh, Yog saron will later refer to himself as the God of Death. Ah, yes, the constant stuns. This dungeon is, uh, it's not that bad when you do this in time walking, but, uh, yeah. Ignore the swirling elements from my uh, heirloom trinket. Ignore that. It's too far away. I'm sorry. Every time I hear the female goblin voice, it just makes me chuckle. It's like apparently she's from Joyzy. It's too far away. I apologize if that sounded bad. I'm just simply pointing out how it sounds. And maybe that was a inside joke when they first were making the goblins. I don't know, but, you know. Now this is an interesting fight. This is actually a boss duo, Scarvald and Dalron. It's a very cool tradition to make unlikely partners work together. Some say it's to allow divergent abilities to complement each other. Others say it's for the amusement of King Ymiron. We'll be getting to him later. Regardless, Scarvald and Dalron are a perfect example of this custom. Between a Vrykul's brawn and a human's necromantic arts, they will punish those who meddle with the Scourge. So this is an interesting fight because when you take one of them down, well, they'll basically, the other one will basically keep going, but it will also get back up as a ghost if the other one is still up. So like, if I take down Scarvald there, he'll get back up as a ghost until the other one is defeated. So you kind of want to make sure that you're not just focusing one down, but you're trying to actually focus them down, you know, evenly, you know? Dalron, see if you can muster the nerve to join my attack. By all means, don't assess the situation, you halfwit. Just jump into the fray. So yeah, Scarvald has charge, he's got stone strike, and he has enrage. Dalron has summon skeletons, Debilitate, and Shadow Bolt, of course. See? So I killed Dalron, and you so, see there, he got back up as a ghost. Sort of necromancer, let's death stop him. I knew you were worthless. So, I, so that's what, hap what he says when you take down Dalron first. You'll notice I can't kill Dal Dalron again, because he's a ghost. So you have to kill Scarvald. So yeah, kind of an interesting fight that you have to make sure you take uh, them down evenly, otherwise the other one will just keep coming back up and just keep fighting until the other one's defeated. Plenty of Rykul throughout, of course. Wargs also here helping them out. And of course, Proto Drakes. As you can see.
So yeah, you usually have to go ahead and take out some of these mobs on your way through when you're doing this, like, either as a leveling dungeon or in time walking. Now, this is one of the first examples of what I'm talking about when it comes to the presence of the Lich King is usually present throughout almost all the dungeons. Or has some kind of influence. This is Ingvar the Plunderer. Ingvar's brute strength is legendary even among the Vrykul. Rumor has it that he once bested King Ymiron in a brawl. The truth, however, is unknown. But purveyors of that tale usually don't live for a retelling. Ingvar has promised the Lich King that he will use all measures of brutality to hold the keep, a promise that he dare not break. So yeah, he's basically trying to... Um, get as many of these Vrykul to work alongside with the Scourge as possible. So you could kind of consider the, the Vrykul here to be that first front line of defense against us. Though, remember, the Lich King wants us to go through them. But we'll get to that later. Or at least I talk about that in the raid video. But yeah, we'll talk about that. I can talk about that also when we get to some of the later dungeons. And paint my face with your blood! So, in his first phase, he has Smash, Enrage, Staggering Roar, and Cleave. So yeah, that's Smash where he smashed all players in a cone, inflicting physical damage. He has Cleave. He'll then do Staggering Roar, which does physical damage and interrupts any spells that are being cast. And Enrage, of course, will uh, increase his attack speed. And you can see it's stacking up and stacking, and stacking, and it can stack up to 50 times. So the longer this fight goes on, the more his enrage will stack. And he can just keep growing and growing. Kind of like, um... Kind of like Gruul from Burning Crusade. Now, when we first take him down, however, that's a, you would think that's it. But no. My life for the death god. Ingvar, your pathetic failure will serve as a warning to all. You are damned. Arise and carry out the master's will. I return. A second chance to carve your skull! So, yeah. That's what he was brought back as. We killed him, but this is Northrend. Of course, the Lich King would have one of his... <laughs> one of his servants, one of those, uh, Valkyr... To bring him back because of course he can do that so he's now undead and he now has different abilities he has dreadful roar which interrupts any spells are being cast and it makes you take additional damage from shadow damage and it lasts for one minute and can stack up to 40 times you'll notice this debuff on me that because he keeps doing shadow damage it can just keep on stacking unless we get it behind a pillar and have line of sight. This is why usually in time walking, when he does that, you'll see players get around the pillar here to avoid getting hit by his roar. And of course he has Dark Smash, which now also does shadow damage. He has Shadow Axe, which has the axe spin as you see. And then he also has Woe Strike, which does physical damage and afflicts the target with Woe Strike. Any healing the target receives will, while affected by that, will inflict shadow damage to the healer. So yeah, he's a pretty nasty fight. Now, if he wanted to, the Lich King could just bring him back, but... You know, as many times as he wants, but... Uh, clearly, it's... Uh, not worth it. He's clearly not worth bringing back yet again. So, now, 
if you want to quickly get back to the front and turn these quests in, you just go through here. Sorry, right, you're usually always going to land it in water. Now, of course, what you don't want to do, like if you're a shaman, don't turn on water walking yet. And if you're a DK, don't turn on Path of Frost to kind of like troll your teammates. Don't do that. What do you seek? I serve Excellent the work. Banshee Queen. With their leader removed, our efforts against these Rykul should be more successful. I watch. I listen. Every blade we take from them is one less embedded in the soldier's flesh. My arrows strike true. Revenge feels good. To think that this is but a taste of what's to come. Arthas will get what he deserves soon enough. That's I another watch. thing. You're going I to listen. hear people refer to the second Lich King as Arthas interchangeably, constantly. They're either going to refer to him as the Lich King or as Arthas constantly, because to them, it doesn't make a difference. They're one and the same. Though, as we find out, that's actually not true. They are different, but we'll save that for some other time later. And I will definitely be uh, talking more about Arthas and referring to some of the stuff from from the old lord. Now, let me go ahead and say this right now. I hate what they did with the changes to the lore involving the Lich King in Shadowlands. I hate it. So much so to the point where I almost don't want, even want to recognize it or acknowledge it as we go through these. I want to just simply still refer to the lore that we had before Shadowlands because I liked how it was before that. And honestly, I have no problem doing that. So... If I do, don't, like, get upset about it or make a big deal out of it because I'd rather just simply refer to the lore that we liked before Shadowlands kind of, well, ruined it. But anyways. Now, hey, we took down Ingvar! Yay! But, um, the bright cool threat is still not done. We still have one more place to go here in this fortress to deal with someone else that uh, you'll probably uh, see yet again down the road in this series. But uh, we will be heading into the other part of Utgard Keep when we return. The Utgard Pinnacle. Stay tuned. <laughs>